Hello and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly hangout where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, send questions and comments to our Twitter page at Mason Roundtable or on the Facebook event page for episode 159 the right of Memphis. You know me, my name is John Ruark, past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. Now I hand it off to Jason Richards for his introduction. Hey, good evening, everybody. Jason Richards here, worshipful master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in the District of Columbia. All right. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Happy to be here. Juan Sepulveda. Hello, everybody. Juan Sepulveda here from the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast and a brother from Orange Blossom Lodge number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida. Thank you, Juan. And last but not least, Robert Johnson. Hey, guys. RJ, Robert Johnson uh, from Waukegan Lodge number 78, past master there, current secretary. And Juan likes Maker's Mark. Delish. Good stuff. Us. Us. We. Delish. Us. <laughs> no. All right. Let's get to Masonic news. We have, of course, first on the docket, the 300th celebration of Freemasonry that we are hosting come June 23rd, June 24th of this year, entitled 300 Freemasonry's Legacy, Freemasonry's Future. If you want to find out more, we have the full agenda posted and uh, the frequently asked questions are being updated. Uh, we do have some hotels uh, booked at a discounted rate. Uh, I just haven't updated the page yet, so my apologies. I was planning a four-year-old birthday party this this past week, and uh, but check that out this week. That'll be updated with the, the coupon code. And new thing added this week: what will be the attire for the event? I've had that question come up. And the attire will be business casual for the majority of the day, but a coat and tie for the dinner Saturday night. There's plenty of places to Boom. step aside and uh, slip into your uh, coat and tie. We're we'll trying to keep it classy as we culminate the event. So if you want to get a ticket, go ahead on over to the masonicroundtable.com slash 300 and go buy your ticket. See you there. Next up on Masonic News, we have an article from the past bastard. Now we did mentioned something uh, a couple weeks ago from Chris Hodap's blog on the the adults running the Job's Daughters International having some intellectual property issues. And we even routed them to our IP, their intellectual property slash copyright episode that we did uh, because they were trying to copyright the logo. Um, so timely. Which is, which is within their purview as an organization. Yes. It's just a bit draconian when you place such strict rules on your organization's branding that you you don't even allow your your members to um, to do anything with it. So what's the, what's, what's the fun in that? You're really cutting yourself out of of advertising completely at yeah. that point. It's um, like, hey, uh, you want to have a uh, Job's daughter's pancake breakfast? Totally cool. Don't you dare put the logo on the ticket. It's yeah, a it, in fact, don't even mention Job's Daughters International. <clears throat> I mean, it's just... Well, they're trying to create a separation between Pancake Breakfast and their brand, which I understand. Fundraiser, right? Yes, but who, who doesn't like hoodies? Like, hoodies are amazing. I'll give you that. Yeah, so... I, I will give the past bastard credit where credit is due. This was actually one of their more clever articles um, you know, talking about the, the Job's Daughters International uh, trying to sue God for, for trademark infringement um, because the book of Job was included in the Bible. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the, one of the best parts of the entire article really is, is where they, uh, they say, you know, we don't, we don't want to get rid of the book of Job. We just want to cut down on the versions and control it a little bit better. So if you want to, you can buy the authorized version 
at our like you know online store. You know, it kind of reminds me of like when the someone wrote Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Yes, right? they took Pride and Prejudice because it was public domain, and they just changed some of the story to include zombies, and then resold it as a new intellectual property. Right. Mm -hmm. Now this this is what you could do: King James version, public domain. So <laughs> take the book <laughs> of Job, right? Modify it. So it has Job's daughters as a key attribute of as opposed to like the last sentence of the book. Right. <laughs> it's it, it wasn't Job who went through all the trials. It was his daughters who went through all the trials. I don't know. That would be pretty funny. Why why rebrand just that book? Just uh, uh King James Brown, King of Soul. <laughs> so I have seen, let's see, I've seen the Lolcat Bible full of memes like I can has salvation. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I've seen the Hacker Bible, Bible too, all written in like Leet speak. It's pretty funny. Oh my God. So there, there you go. Job's daughters, get on that. And then the last article I just found right before showtime was one related to a Russian diplomat. Jason, tell us more about this. All right. So there's a member of the Russian Duma, which is their parliament who um, has uh, called upon the rest of the Russian Duma and the Russian government to probe into Russian Freemasonry uh, to ascertain whether or not they are truly agents of subterfuge under the control of the West. And this, this is an interesting article. I've done a lot of research personally into um, Russian Freemasonry in, in general because I love Russian history. And it's it's not too far off with carrying the line that Catherine the Great did. So Freemasonry came into Russia mid 1700s with the birth of what the Russians termed the intelligentsia, which was essentially their their scholarly, their learned class. So their philosophers, their historians, their scientists, um, and that that flourished really in the you know, 1700s up until the early 1800s with the advent of Catherine the Great. So at this point, you had Peter the Great, um, who sought to westernize Russia and make it more like Europe, because uh, the Russians uh, always had this almost Napoleonic complex of, of being a backward society where, you know, men grew out their beards and, and they lived off the land. And, and Peter the Great, who was the Tsar of Russia at that point during the 1700s, um, said, no, you know, we want to model ourselves after Europe. We want to become a, a smarter civilization, a, a more polished civilization. And so he, in addition to doing a bunch of goodwill campaigns to Europe, he brought back a lot of European principles and ideals. And as part of that forced westernization of, of Russian culture, you had this growing learned class um, evolving in Russian or in Russia with like, you know, Alexander Pushkin, who is, uh, you know, one of Russia's, you know, most well-known poets and, and others. Um, and that's really when Freemasonry started to take a hold in Russia as well. Um, however, Catherine the Great comes in uh, early 1800s. I, I don't know the dates off the top of my head, but um, she starts getting very concerned about um, regime change and forced regime change. And the idea that these learned, these members of the learned populace might rise up and and overthrow her as as the tsar, so she ends up um, persecuting a lot of the intelligentsia, kicking them out of Russia completely, and at that point, Freemasonry goes out of Russia with them, um, and, it, and it dies at that point. Um, up until about the early 2000s when I believe it was in 2005, the Grand Lodge of Russia um, came back and, and was, you know, formed again. And it's been operating in Russia since 2005 with a couple thousand members, Russian members of, of the organization. So this this member of the, the Russian parliament, the MP, whatever you want to call him, um, says he's he's taking a very Catherine the Great conspiracy theorist approach to say, look, Freemasonry came in 
with the intelligentsia from the West in the 1700s, um, it has been seen as an agent of subterfuge and, and uh, politically motivated agent. And he's he's playing up this this 18th century idea of Freemasonry as something that could threaten, you know, the not necessarily the regime in Russia today, but the the lawmaking process in in Russia. And uh, he's he's doing it under the auspices of of, you know, Christianity, at least that's that's what the article is trying to make it out to be. Um the fact of the matter is, you know, they gay propaganda, you know, the the lawmaker was was known for his campaign targeting gay propaganda. Um, but the idea of of gay propaganda and homosexuality in, in Russia is is actually much honestly, it's much more of, of a political issue in Russia um, than it is even in the United States today, arguably, uh, because the the Russian government is just um, so against it. Um, and, and there's so much persecution and, and, um, against, you know, members of the alternative lifestyle. So, you know, the, the article says, you know, well, it's because he's, he's a Christian lawmaker. It's like, well, you know, everybody in Russia is Eastern Orthodox, just like, you know, everybody in Europe is Roman Catholic. I mean, it's something you you grow up with as as a tradition, but it's it's more so the the political motivations behind um, behind the policies than than the religion itself. Yeah. Well, I hope everyone like today and you know in the United States. I hope everyone's enjoyed uh, our episode on Russian Freemasonry, and I hope you guys will come back next week. As we talk about the right of Memphis, no, yeah, no, we should probably do a full, uh, a full show. On. I was, I was hanging on every word, Jason. That's amazing. You're like, and this happened, and that happened, and yeah, like, why haven't we done a show on this before? <laughs> I know what we're doing now. Why didn't, you know that you know the, uh, I'm going to say the a word. Uh, you know the scene in Spaceballs when uh, President Screw's like, why didn't somebody tell me my ass was so big? <laughs> yes, I felt like the same thing. It was like, why didn't somebody tell me Jason knew so much? <laughs> Yeah, you'd never know, right? <laughs> By looking at me. Jason's the new Nick. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I don't have nearly that much time. <laughs> and I'm not a bottled blonde. That's Neither hard. is Nick, but... I, I just thought that it was, this article was great because, one, it was on true news, so you, you know it has to be true. Second... <laughs> hence, hence, well, hence the emphasis on... Mega is on Christianity and his, yeah. his Christian background. It had Russian. I need to squash that. Christians targeting gay propaganda, New World Order, and I, I I'm sure if you dig hard enough, there's lizard people in there somewhere. So it's it, it's just look at the, the just look at the tags on the article. It tells you everything you need to know. Well, you know, Russia actually does have a uh, a synthetic drug problem with something called crocodile, which uh, actually is a synthetic drug that that turns your skin scaly like a lizard. So. Those are people are probably in there. There you go. Dang. Wow. That's the 99th degree. Oh. <laughs> That's a great segue. Into a DMT. A <laughs> DMT for show. DMT makes you a lizard man. Dimethyltryptophan. FTW. <laughs> yeah. So about that, this week's episode is on the right of Memphis. Um, RJ threw this one out here because RJ has been researching this for a long time and ever and ever and ever and because it, you know it grew up in his hometown and so he'll talk a little bit about that so why don't we just kick it right off and hand the talking stick to robert sure. I will, his slides up here on my screen cool so i got a i got a really uh basic slideshow so if you're following along great uh and then stop me if you have questions and uh, so essentially what we have to you have to understand, first of all, the right of Memphis grew out of uh, the right of Mizram, which by the time the right of Memphis came along, uh, Mizram was pretty much defunct. And then later on, there was a combination. But anyway, so the right of Memphis, I have a title up here. It says clandestine order or scapegoat. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit uh so first of all 
there's a little bit of a timeline. So um, if you can, I'll, I'll kind of mention some things as we go along here. But uh, according to uh, it's uh, J. A. Gottlieb, uh, he says that the right of Memphis was given to uh, this guy named Sam Samuel Honus, who was a native of Cairo. This uh, the guy who gave it to him. His name is Ormus, who is said to have been a Sepharic priest of Alexandria and had these degrees. Sam Honus was a native of Cairo. He brings these degrees over to France in like 18... He, they actually get there in 1813. They introduced the degrees in 1814. Uh, they formed a grand body of uh, Right of Memphis in 1815. And then basically uh, a bunch of lodges pop up here and there, a good handful, and there's some in Paris. There's some in uh, uh, Brussels and a couple other uh, places there uh, in, I guess, Western Europe. And uh, so this goes on forever. Uh, basically, um, in 1839, there's a couple guys. Uh, one's name is Marconi. The other guy's name is Malay. Marconi uh, becomes what they have as their highest order ever. It's the Grand Hierophant. Um, and so in 1839, he's the Grand Hierophant, like the head of the order. Like It would be like today in Blue Lodge if we had like the... Uh, not just a national grand lodge and a master, like a worldwide owner. Uh, so he's this, right? But what happens is in 1852 in France, uh, it's illegal to call yourself Masonic if you're not recognized by the Grand Orient of France. So they're shut down by civil magistrate in 1852. About 10 years goes by, and what's going on is Marconi's like, this stinks. Like we got to get the right back. So he appeals to the Grand Orient of France for recognition in 1862, um, and then in November of 1862, regulation. I'm sorry, recognition is is granted with stipulations. Uh, so the way I'm going to go through this is a little bit about how they formed, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the structure and kind of what happened and why they're not here anymore. So this was a an official regular recognized Masonic yeah. organization at one period in time. Well, yes and no. Sort so of. go to the next slide and we'll talk about that. Uh, so if you're, if you're watching on the left, that's an actual uh, diagram of a chapter of uh, what they call a chapter of sorrow, uh, which is uh, the 21st degree. Uh, so here's the rub, right? This is the, the bummer part about getting their recognition back. Uh, Grand Orient of France says no problem. We'll recognize you, <clears throat> but you got to give up all your degrees and everything. You got to give them to us. And uh, so these guys have to hand over their degrees and they're like, okay, like preserve it, uh, preserving them. What's going on? Right. Then they're forced to give up all their titles. Man. They're forced into not. Yeah, I know. Right. But when you hear the, the title of their grand master, you're going to be like, oh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> that they gave up the title. So uh, then they're forced into not working any degrees higher than that of the master Mason. Um, and at this point also, it's not even that they can keep using their own degrees of one, two, and three. They have to now conform and use the grand orient of France's three degrees. So they allow the right of Memphis to exist, but it's only in name only. Uh, and then at a point, the degrees four through 33, they were kept active, but in your mind, like just picture a guy taking this, you know, four through 33 degrees and putting them on a shelf and saying, nobody can confer those because you don't have a patent or a warrant to do so. And then they take 34 through 95, 96 and 97. <clears throat> but 34, the reason I don't include 96 and 97 is because those are actually just uh, degrees given to titles, but the actual ceremonies, 34 through 95, are put on a shelf and they're basically treated as garbage, right? Like, there's going to be guys out there listening to this right now going, well, they weren't treated as garbage. But listen, they were put on a shelf. They didn't let anybody touch them. And that's the end of it. Like, they're gone. Um, so you've got this rub, right? So at this point, Marconi's like, okay, what else? Uh, so they force, uh, you go to the next slide real quick. Uh, Marconi has to, is, is, is uh, part of the deal. Marconi has to give up his title as Grand Hierophant forever. And so any lodge that ever talks about the higher degrees 
it mentions the titles that, hey, I used to be the grand hierophant or whatever, disciplined masonically. Like, they sweep it under the rug. All you can be, like, your lodge can be still a, a lodge of um, Memphis, but you can't do anything. And you're and if you tried to put on a fourth degree or a fifth degree or whatever, you got shut down. And any attempt at reconstructing the right was deemed a high Masonic offense. And so why, you know, is what we have to ask. What, what's, what's the big deal? <clears throat> uh, so this is part of the, part of the problem. These guys just get shut down. So next slide. Uh, this is a quote, and this is taken from a letter uh, that was written uh, from the Grand Master of France to uh, a gent in uh, Britain uh, when a lodge, uh, a, a grand uh, consistory of Rite of Memphis was trying to be formed in Lancashire. And the quote is, the Rite of Memphis has been silenced. We tried and succeeded in destroying it. So, like, there's real animosity about this thing. They didn't want it around. And, I, and, and we'll get into a little bit of why that may be. Uh, next slide. So I have a diagram here with some colors and some arrows, but uh, essentially it shows that the right supposedly comes out of Egypt, goes to uh, France, and then over to New York, and then to uh, Chicago, to uh, Detroit, up to uh, over to Lancashire, England, and back to Canada. And along the way, it sprinkles in Italy with, uh, you know, you can talk about Cagliostro all day and his, uh, yeah, Jason, I got slide typos. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, this is where, like, you know, like I said, there'll be some sprinkling of Cagliostro and the Rite of Memphis Miserum together and uh, some of the offshoots. But uh, strictly speaking of the Rite of Memphis, so during the 1860s, uh, uh, Marconi basically is, he leaves um, a, a, after they get their, their patent back or their, their okay that they can be right of Memphis, but without doing any degree work, uh, they head over to New York and they start a temple or a grand consistory in New York, along with a guy named uh, Jay Pettit and uh, Marquis LaRoque. Uh, there's a couple other guys there, a guy named by the name of uh, Colt. Uh, who I'll talk about later, was actually an expelled member in one state, uh, regained admittance into another state, and uh, there's been a whole lot of hoopla about this guy's uh, regularity within the fraternity. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's said that the uh, grand consistory that started in New York was con was condensed to only 30 degrees and without losing their fundamentals. But I think really what they're talking about here is um, essentially he... Uh, gains kind of a, a little bit of a trust issue. Um, he gets some trust from France, right? They're like, oh, you're going to start the right of Memphis in New York. He's like, yeah, we're going to start it in New York. Well, what France doesn't know doesn't hurt him, right? So he starts conferring the other degrees. Uh, and then that catches on. And so at this point you have just what they, it's loosely deemed right of Memphis, um, and so they use the agreement from the Grand Orient, Grand Orient of France out of context to legitimize themselves. Uh, they had ex, like huge growth. Grand masters all over the place were, were joining the Rite of Memphis. Like it was huge. Uh, so in 1866, this is what, what I allude, alluded to earlier, is uh, Grand, uh, the, the, uh, the guy, his name is Colt uh, and Marconi, they uh, basically are trying to start uh, actually, there's a third party who tries to start a grand consistory in Lancashire. And Britain is like, well, this is kind of weird. Let's uh, get to the bottom of this. So you guys legit? And he says, yeah, you know, we got the stuff from France, whatever, whatever. Dude from too Britain. Legit to quit. You're too legit to quit, exactly. The guy <laughs> from uh, Britain contacts the Grand Lodge of, uh, the Grand Orient of France, I should say. And uh, basically, in a nutshell, the guy gives a face palm and he says dang it, you know, this guy said he was starting just doing his thing. We trusted them. They were supposed to just do the first three degrees. And, you know, they're they're clandestine over there. They're being clandestine. We own the rights of those rituals, and nobody has a warrant to confer them. I'm sorry to tell you this, brother, but I think you're going to have the same problem there in Lancashire. Well, the whole issue is 
you know, on the slide, I say 1866 Lancashire for good measure. And that's because it's, it's stated in their kind of in, in the book by uh, J.A. Gottlieb that they did that to establish further legitimacy because the United Grand Lodge of England's there. It's kind of the home of Freemasonry. It legitimizes you by just having a lodge in the same country as something as big as UGLE. So I really think that's the reason why they did that. Uh, uh, so next slide. So we had New York, Chicago, Detroit, and Canada. Uh, Canada was stated later. Um, in fact, if you um, if you are a member of the Grand uh, Grand College of Rites, um, they they uh, it's a three part one, two, and three, and you can see a little bit of the uh, explanation of degrees. Uh, one section is a is pulled from a ritual uh, degree book from Chicago. Uh, the other is pulled from Canada. Um, I'm not sure where part two is. I haven't read the second in the series of that from the, the Collectiana out of the uh, Grand College of Rights yet. I've only read one and three, which uh, define Chicago and Canada. Uh, but rest assured, um, it says right on those covers, you know, it's, it's illegal for a facsimile, yada, yada, yada. So I cannot share those with you. Uh, but if you search the web, you'll find them. Uh, next slide. So what was it about? What did they teach? How were they structured? Uh, so the primary sources for this information, again, comes from the right of Memphis, Canada, which is, I believe, uh, uh, Colossiana, uh, Volume 17, Number 1, um, and then Number 3, which is the Egyptian right of Memphis, 4th through the 96th degree continent of America. Now, that is uh, the actual title of the right that was created at the Valley of Chicago. Uh, right here, my, my home Valley, Chicago, Scottish Rite building, uh, which we actually sold a few years ago um, and created a new building. But at that old building, that's where they, they started the Egyptian Rite of Memphis, 4 through 96, Continent of America. And again, the history of the Rite of Memphis Miserum by J.A. Gottlieb. Uh, so that's where the information is coming from. So if you have any issues with what I'm telling you, that's where you're going to go to correct me. Uh, degree structure. So they had the first craft degrees, possible Egyptian origin or Egyptian flair to them. Now these uh, were familiar, like regular Masonic degrees, correct? Yeah. yeah. So EA, FC, MM, just like you would normally have taken them. Um, however, I do believe in the third degree, you actually represented Osiris rather than Hiram. So um, there are some similarities there. Um, in, in mythos, we should say, just like with uh, many ancient mythos. Uh, Jason does a fantastic piece on uh, uh, the Great Floods, and he can tell you all day long about how many different cult uh, cultures had flood myths. Well, kind of this... Almost story. every single one that we know of. Yeah, so same thing, right? We have a, we have a, uh, a hero who basically is so morally upright, he won't do the wrong thing. Uh, kind of the same thing is happening here. Uh, so fourth, Sounds like a party pooper. Yeah, he really is. He's a, he's a party pooper, Osiris, that guy. Uh, he gets buried in a tree, and it's wild. But, no uh, wonder they, like, dismembered him and put him in a box. Eh, the real party pooper. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, again, one through three, craft degrees. Four through 18 were broken down to science and ancient work, as they say. The 19th degree through the 45th were philosophic, morality, basically philosophy in general. Your 46th through your 90th degree were historic and mystic, so mythology and theosophy. Um, one of these degrees actually has a nine-day fast, if you can believe that. Um, so 91 through 95 were purely administrative the 96th degree was reserved for Grand Master, and the 97th degree was for the Grand Hierophant, so the head of the order, kind of like a Grand Magus for life. Uh, so that, so that nine-day fast was speculative, not operative, right? You just pretend to fast for eight days. Absolutely not. not. These are absolutely degrees where you actually had to do these things, which uh, is probably another reason why <clears throat> uh, the system was considered an oddity and and quote unquote weird, and uh, was not always accepted by everybody, but apparently had enough grandmasters behind it to uh, give it some real swinging power. 
Mm. None of the the title chasers wanted to put up with the fast in order to get the you know grand hierophant. I don't want to do that. Shut when, it down. When yeah. you hear the title of the Grand Master, you're going to be like, I'll take that title. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, next slide. It's worth it for the title. Uh, yeah, so uh, some excerpts from some of the degrees. Fourth degree, there's an illusion. Uh, they talk about the password of the degree, right? It says the human head cultivated the dwelling place of God. Uh, so it was kind of interesting. They alluding to some, uh, you know, without man's perception of existence, it, nothing exists. Uh, they, they talk about knowing thyself is the key to knowing the true name. The name is in capital because they are, I think they are referring to the word or the tetragrammaton. Uh, in the sixth degree, it deals with the uh, burial vault of Osiris. And they, uh, they describe the Shekinah, which is pretty interesting as well. Uh, so degree highlights, again, and an apprentice, fellow craft, master mason. Now here's where we get creative with titles. Discrete master. Perfect master, sublime master, just master. I'm not going to read all 97. I'll read you 21 of them. Uh, master of the temple, master elect, grand master elect, sublime master elect. This one's cool. Master of geometry. And of course, then you get these peppers, in it, these little peppered degrees that we are all familiar with, right? The Royal Arch of Enoch, which is really interesting the way they do it. Uh, the secret vault. Uh, Knight of the Flaming Sword, Knight of Memphis. Next slide. Uh, so in the sixth degree, they talk about the obelisk. And this is kind of interesting, right? This might be kind of an illusion. Some some guys might understand this, uh, the way we talk about our aprons. The obelisk, it's four sides representing the tenets of the right of Memphis, reverence, truth, justice, and purity. Just kind of uh, interesting there. Uh, to see some of the parallels that we still kind of use in some ritual today. Uh, next slide. You mentioned <clears throat> one of the degrees refers to the Shakina. Yeah. Which degree is that? Sixth. The sixth. And the sixth also talks about the, the obelisk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot uh, of stuff in these degrees. They, they vary quite a bit. Well, there's uh, one thing though that I wanted to, to point out the, the Shakina, as I understand it is the, the presence of God or the, uh, the, the spirit of God, right? Yeah. But there's also an allusion to the feminine, uh, the feminine part of, of God, like the feminine aspect of God. So I, I thought it was interesting that you have a phallic symbol. Yep. And the Shekinah together. Uh-huh. That's really cool. So our Southern jurisdiction, uh, uh, gents who know the Royal secret, Check it out. That's awesome. Um, so you got the, what the are you guys talking about? <laughs> I a for you. We'll find out one day. You're we'll the new Nick. I got a petition for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the thirteenth degree, uh, there's a note, right? So I put on here the Royal Arch of Enoch. This is the interesting part. It, it in the degree ritual, it actually talks about how each vault, these guys. So if you're familiar with the uh, of Enoch and how he had to build these vaults to uh, bury the true word at the bottom. Well, in the degree, these guys discover um, plates, metal plates, and each one has a different name. So one is Jaho, one is Ja, Eliel, Eliah, Joheb, Adonai, Elohanan, and Jubel, and so on and so forth. And they finally discover the word at the bottom. But then also they follow it up uh, in the 14th degree where they give a genealogical pedigree of the men who knew the true word or the, the, the name. So it's kind of like this genealogy of who knew it. And then they also give an allusion to the number of the corrupted name, as they say it. And they say the number of the corrupted name is nine. Uh, so I haven't really jumped into that, but uh, I have a, 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 a sneaky suspicion, uh, companion uh, Chris Tilly, out of Missouri probably knows a little bit about that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so in 17th degree, Night of the Orient, 18th degree, Night of the Rose Croix, or Qua. So again, a little bit of flavor that you guys may uh, familiarize yourself with. Uh, very similar in nature. Um, number 19 is called Public Degrees. And so when you read it, it reads very much like uh, an installation. So... I'm not really sure why they considered it a degree or maybe it was not 
an installation. Maybe I just read it wrong when I did read it. Uh, the 20th degree is the Knight Adept Consecrator, and the 21st degree, Knight Adept, Adept Eulogist with a Chapter of Sorrow. So a few slides back, if you looked at the, uh, the little uh, diagram of the Lodge, the Chapter of Sorrow, that's how it was set up. Uh, so you're 91 through 95. Those are those administrative degrees. Patriarch, Grand Commander, and these are all uh, preempted with Patriarch. So you got Grand Commander, Grand Generalissimo, Grand uh, Captain General, Grand Inspector General. So that's uh, an allusion maybe to the 33rd degree. Uh, the ancient except the Scottish Rite, both northern and southern jurisdictions. Uh, then you get the Patriarch, Grand Orator, Prince. Uh, and then you have the Grand Master, who is the Sovereign Patriarch, Grand Defender of Truth, Sovereign Sublime Magus of the 96th degree. So you could have that title if you want. Uh, that's the equivalent to a Grand Master. And then you have a 97th degree, which is a Grand Hierophant, leader for all right of Memphis, worldwide for life. Um, now that's not explicitly explicitly stated anywhere, um, but that is uh, the takeaway when you kind of do some cross-reference and you read a bunch of sources that's kind of what it leads to and would that that mean that this is a progressive line that we're seeing here you know i don't i couldn't tell you i, I would figure it's probably very much like a uh a progressive line and it probably starts at 91 and these guys would work their way up but the thing is is that nobody moves up until 97 dies oh look at that. so this is why it was such a big deal when they told Marconi he had to give it up. It's like, well, crap, that's my thing. What am I going to do? Um, uh, next slide. Uh, so the decor, uh, they talk about the Grand Star of Sirius. So, uh, and there's the Golden Branch of Lucius, the uh, the Libic Chain. Uh, Gents out there, if you want to go ahead and Google Libic Chain, I think your top search results is going to give you a website that gives you no other links but possibly has a little bit of degree work contained within it. So you can check that out if you would like. Uh, the motif on the right is kind of the uh, main symbol of the uh, right of Memphis. It's got the egg, which... Uh, is typical of what used to be on top of the pillars, uh, which represented the, uh, the birth of the universe, followed by uh, the seven stars underneath, the seven liberal arts and sciences, and then you've got the two above, uh, all-seeing eye, that kind of thing, but uh, really heavy in the symbolism. Uh, next slide. Uh, so then there was this U.S. fallout. And this is kind of like where the downfall starts, right? So by 1866, these guys are widespread, grandmasters galore all over the place. Like these guys are going everywhere. Um, and in 1869, uh, this is from uh, J.A. Gottlieb's book. He says that a spurious ancient accepted Scottish rite shows up in New York. Now, I'm only guessing here, thinking it's either he's referring to Cerno or Cernoism, or maybe he's talking about the northern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite or what later became that. But anyway, it reads as though... Don't most southern jurisdiction Scottish Rite Masons consider the NMJ to be spurious anyway? <laughs> they certainly joke about it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, so these guys decide like... Because they are a legitimate Masonic body. And even though they may have, uh, they're, maybe they're practicing not what they're supposed to legally under Masonic law, but they do care, right? So they withdraw for safety reasons. They want to withdraw recognition. Well, later on, that doesn't really work because these guys continue to be recognized and they withdrew recognition. So it looks bad on them, right? So that's check. That's one of many checks against them. Uh, then they've got several lodges that are happening all over the states, and they're chartered by this sovereign, ancient, accepted Scottish rite in Louisiana. And uh, they're like, what is going on here, right? So the Grand Orient of France decides to unrecognize this sovereign, accepted Scottish rite in Louisiana. Well, there's fallout from that. And so the charters from these rite of Memphis kind of came from these, these ancient, accepted Scottish rites in Louisiana, and so Grand Orient decides, I'm pulling recognition of Louisiana, ancient accepted Scottish Rite sovereign body. And, uh, of course, 
uh, the right of Memphis decides to follow uh, in like and decide to unrecognize Grand Orient of France. So, great. Another check. So at this point, the Grand Hierophant is this dude, uh, I can't remember his first name, but the last name is uh, uh, Bolt, uh, Bart, Bark, I can't remember. Sorry. Uh, anyway, the Grand Hierophant, he's been expelled from a jurisdiction uh, in the southern states, he rejoins and he goes everywhere. And the reason I know this is uh, I can pick up the uh, grand proceedings of the Grand Lodge of State of Illinois, and we uh, can read in there all these statements about where this you know the Grand Master has done his research in the state of Illinois, and he's followed this guy's like Masonic trail all over the place. And basically, Grand Master is not impressed with this guy thinks he's kind of a jerk, right? And so there's a ton of trash talk happening from the Grand Orient of France because these guys are doing the work even though they said they wouldn't. Uh, Grand Lodge of Massachusetts sends a warning to Grand Lodge of Illinois. This is in the proceedings as well. Uh, you have a new threat, right? There's this Egyptian right of Memphis in the Valley of Chicago for the North American continent. And when this happens, this is when in the preceding books of uh, 1870, 71, 72, 73, 74, and 75, um, there is a lot of uh, the 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 uh, grand representatives, uh, a guy named D.C. Cregeer, uh, namesake of a lodge right here in Wheeling, was the grand rep to the right of Memphis. And uh, things got crazy. Like People were just talking tons of trash. In fact, some of the statements that were said were just outrageous and you wouldn't even believe it if i told you but i think we know masons and we would kind of believe it if if i if uh we get into it but uh next slide so the the valley of chicago is gaining this huge power grandmasters are joining every year at grand lodge sessions again there's all this uh these talk about uh you know how how awful this is in fact the grandmaster of illinois uh, is talking about uh bert bert's his name uh the grand hierophant and he says yeah this bert has been circulating somewhat extensively among the fraternity in this state peddling out what he terms the higher degrees of masonry somewhere near as high as a hundred i believe at the rate of 10 cents a piece very cheap masonry if it is masonry and still the supply is greater than the demand for his carpet bag has seemed to suffer no uh, diminution so these guys are just calling them carpet baggers and degree peddlers. Um, and they don't even know, right? He says somewhere near as high as a hundred. Like they have no idea. They didn't like, if you read these proceedings, it basically the, everybody who talks bad about the, the right of Memphis basically says, yeah, we kind of don't know really anything about them. Don't like them though. That's and what a lot of people, a lot of, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't like them though. And they're, and, they're, and they're weird though. They're weird. We don't like them. Why? We don't yeah, understand it, yeah. so stop it. Yeah, we don't. We don't like it. We don't understand it. Um, so what's interesting, though, again, just complete ignorance. And in the proceedings, there are a few places where they actually slam the subject, the subject of esoterica, which is uh, like an overwhelming theme of these ninety-six, ninety-seven degrees. Now you read the stuff yourself firsthand, right? By going through your Grand Lodge proceedings back I in the eighteen sixties. Yeah, so I have, uh, oh, um, best word count. I've got uh, 20,385 words on the Rite of Memphis coming from the 1870 to 1875 Grand Lodge sessions. Uh, all of it is just rhetoric. Yeah, it's, wow. it's uh, Next slide. Uh, so in their minute book revelations, right? So I said this because um, I have to look it up and I will gladly post a link to it because I think I got it off of archive.org. Uh, but I had their minute book from the right of Memphis in Chicago. And uh, what I gleaned from reading the, I don't know, whatever it was, 300 pages of minutes was the right of Memphis by all accounts should be legitimate. Uh, they were dedicated, to, they were dedicated to masonry and, and, the push of blue lodges, like essentially they admitted time and time again that if you were, you couldn't be admitted to the right of Memphis unless you uh, were a good standing in, in your blue lodge. They, although in the past, this is something else people had a problem with was that they said they could confer the first three degrees. That was a, 
It's it's not true. They at one time conferred the three degrees because that's what the Grand Orient of France told them they could do. But they weren't doing that anymore. They were just conferring four through whatever. And uh, they admitted, just like any Scottish Rite does today, any York Rite does, you got to maintain Blue Lodge first. Uh, so that's what they did. The philosophy was deemed kind of incompatible because there was actual work that had to be done rather than just going and seeing something and boom, you're a 32nd. And the right was genuinely disheartened by the hostility towards it. So you can read in those minutes that these guys are concerning, or they're, they're really concerned with the way people are viewing them. They're like, why does everybody hate us? Why can't we just do our thing? I don't get this. Uh, and there's some possible reasons to that also. Uh, so next slide. So conclusion, I think my own conclusions are that it was shut down, blackballed, ostracized, uh, bullied into nothingness because of A, it wasn't every man's fraternity. I put that in quotes because uh, it wasn't for everybody, and that's what they needed. And B, Freemasonry did not want to be associated with a weird stuff uh, since it's post-Morgan affair. And C, fear of a national Masonic influence. So what I mean by that is you have one body that's controlled by one guy for the rest of his life, and you had all these grandmasters joining that body. And I think there's a general fear that perhaps whatever that one guy at the top of Memphis Miserum, the Grand Hierophant, could maybe influence his constituents. Uh, and they would then bring that to Grand Lodge levels. It's the, it's you know, we have the same kind of uh, setup with the uh, the Knights Templar in the U.S., but the leader of the Knights Templar in the U.S. is not there for life. Um, and this is the same thing that happened with a certain uh, gentleman who tried to bring back the uh, uh, the Rite of Perfection, which is a Scottish Rite uh, body. And he tried to do that and set himself up. And the way it works is Magus, uh, and it's Magus for life. Um and basically they said, nope, can't do that. And he was shut down and he was ostracized and bullied and everything else. And people had nothing but bad things to say about him because uh, he tried to be guy for life. But that's just the thing. Uh, yeah. Wow. So if it was, here, if it, was uh, it was really... They were trying to do the right thing. They weren't trying to be a spurious organization. They weren't trying to, uh, I mean, they may were trying to bend the rules yep. because of the constraints put on them, uh, but their heart was in the right place. Yeah. Uh, having read, you know, some of the degrees in the Collecticana, it, it they're, I mean, they're legit. They, they, they build on top of the, the things we're taught in the first three degrees of Blue Lodge. Uh, even one of the degrees I was talking to the guys in the chat room earlier actually goes into much better detail about what charity is in masonry than any grand lodge um ritual i've seen uh, and how it actually goes into specific details charity is not about giving it's about love for another person and and that's all spelled out explicitly in in their degree system so you could you know you could tell that their their philosophy was sound and was based off of masonic principles and so um yeah it just it's sad that it had to happen because of emotions and politics. And the yeah, it's well, it's almost one hundred percent politics. But what were you saying? And that's and that's the thing, Robert. Um, when you look, especially at you know the pl proliferation of Yorkite uh, bodies, invitational and otherwise, um, it comes down to when you're forming a new right or. You found these degrees. I totally didn't write them myself, but we're going to start practicing them in my own, you know, little club of an organization. Um, it's really about buy-in and, and who you know at the at the Grand Lodge level. Yep. And if you if you aren't part of that in crowd, then it's very very easy um, to get your entire organization just squashed and delegitimized. So unfortunately, politics does reign supreme, and and it's all about who you know and and what you can do for for those who you know. Yeah, I mean it's kind of the and so, you know, and I heard a story. I'm gonna I'm gonna say, my good friend Arthur uh, appealed to the Grand College of Rights and said, "We would like to put on one or two 
of the degrees from the right of Memphis for educational purposes. And they said, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and so when I say, when I say Arthur, Art knows who he is, but I'm not talking about De Hoyos. Uh, it's a friend of mine who goes by a pseudonym, but uh, yeah, like they just told him no. Fratter's name is Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's bizarre, you know, the way they got treated and just like for no good reason. Like, but then again, I am pretty liberal in my leanings, right? So I think uh, co-masonry, LaDroid Humane, the American Federation of Rights, I think they should all be recognized, but that's just me. So let me let me take over social media tonight because I let Jason run with the uh, the great extensive research in the <laughs> Russian Freemasonry. Um, in fact, that was actually two of the comments tonight uh, on on Facebook were from Scott Newberry and Mike, the intern. That yes, Jason, we're doing a Russian Freemasonry episode. So meet. So cue that up next week, maybe. Hmm? Huh? Uh, it'll require a bit more research on my end before I do that. You're right. You could just wax poetic like you did. Yeah, you, wow. <laughs> you don't have to have PowerPoint like uh, RJ did. Yeah. Um, then another <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike, the intern, also had a, had a great point. Um, if someone were to actually exemplify these degrees, we could all do, we could do these like one to ninety six in a one day class. That would be a, a good option. <laughs> <laughs> Have a weekend. Uh, so you know, I'll, I'll say this: um, I am aware there there is uh, the right of Memphis. It is still labeled clandestine. Uh, it is still practiced. I know there are regular masons who practice it on the down low. Uh, I know there are uh, grand consistories down in Tennessee uh, and other places. So Scott Newbury calls it headlights to Hierophant. Headlights. <laughs> yes, that would be the, the name of the, uh, the, the, the crash course, one day class to the 90s. Uh, that's all we got for social media. RJ, you blew us all away. Uh, good job on the presentation. Wait, there's like three three more extra slides on there. Oh, you got to be kidding me. No, I, I had just bonus material if we had time. And since there's no social media. Well, here's the extra part of the show. Here we go. Miscellaneous. <laughs> Not safe for work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mother, hide your children. Uh, so lodges known to exist in 1850, there were uh, two in Paris, was called Osiris and Des Philadelphs. Brussels was, uh, I don't know how to say that in French, La Bienveillance, or, and, and then De uh, Heliopolis. Um, the Canadian ritual book states that the craft has mostly ancient Egyptian origins. So they're talking about Freemasonry. Uh, and we've got a lot of guys who say that's absolutely not true. But he says this is true because Egypt is one of the cradles of civilization and some of the first evidence of ritual usage appears there. And he says, this is true because occult scholars said so. But my, my question is who? And then I wrote, you know, MPH. Are we talking about Manly P. Hall, Lost Keys of Freemasonry? Because uh, if that's your only source, I think that's kind of a bummer. Uh, Canadian ritual book continued. Uh, the third degree, you represented Osiris. That Hiram, sixth degree, you represent Anubis. Uh, and the composing body. So just like in the Scottish Rite, you've got the four bodies that four or five bodies actually that comprise it. Uh, in this, you had the sages of the pyramids, grand architects of the mysterious city, sovereign princes of the Magi of the sanctuary of Memphis and sanctuary or lodge, the mystical temple, John's favorite, the liturgical college and the grand consistory. That's where uh, Nick's going to go. Uh, each, each body has its own constitution and bylaws. Uh, the New York consistory started by AJ Seymour. That's the other guy I was trying to get at and the uh, the right of Memphis quote is a religion, is what J. A. Gottlieb said in the right. That's like the in the first four pages of the book on the uh, on the order. Um, and Gottlieb also claimed that hout grade masonry or high grade masonry was in use as far back as twenty one hundred years before the Christian era! Exclamation point. He continues by saying. It is impossible to call into question the authenticity and legitimacy of the right of Memphis. So, uh, but that's, forgive me, those are 
what I would call unfounded statements, uh, but, you know, logic and stuff. <laughs> wow. Very, very good research, RJ. Um, so I guess we should start wrapping things up, given the time. Uh, but I'll, I'll ask one, one last question. So, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that they got, I mean, they got the bum deal, right? I definitely think they got the bum deal. Um, if they legitimized it today at the Grand College of Rights said, let's, let's legitimize it and let's let people work it if they want to and start lodges and, and did it. I think it'd be cool. That's fine. I don't know if that grand hierophant thing would work for a lot of folks though. Title chasers. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sorry, you'll never get it. Literally. There's no chance. <laughs> All right. Unless you're off the guy who's got it now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking about the uh, episode of Futurama where he's on the, the water planet and they keep trying to off the, the next king. And like, you only are king for like a day because the next guy's trying to off you. And, and... you drank the king. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please do not drink the emperor. Yeah. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. I remember that. All right, let's. Uh, I was thinking about the Family Guy episode where Peter is like, "Cause I'm married." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, Juan, why don't you start uh, taking us home and wrapping things up? All right, I was just here listening to all this. I could only imagine being able to read those documents uh, and going through that investigative work. So, thank you so much for doing that. Um, one thing that I saw that I that I found particularly interesting about the right was that it was described as a deist um, organization, a deist right, and it says where the deity was referred to as the sublime architect of all worlds. I thought that was a pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Look. Well, think about right in the Masonic ritual, we say numberless worlds are around us. So there's an allusion to that there is also. That's really cool. Uh, I just wanted to say to the brothers that are listening, thank you so much for listening. I can see that we still have a lot of brothers that are watching live, even though we've been, you know, talking about this for about an hour. We have a few dozen brothers that are watching live. If you're watching this, uh, please do me a favor and click on the thumbs up on on the youtube channel and if you have haven't subscribed yet please do so uh, we know that a lot of brothers watch the shows but they don't subscribe um stop being a lurker and join us <laughs> jump in full force yeah <laughs> no I, I thank you very much for listening and for and for watching the the program um and and i like what we see here today we saw a little glimpse into some of the research that brother jason has been doing uh, it's part of his education. Uh, uh, his formal education has, you know, reflected uh, in, in today's episode and in and, and Robert's contribution to today, like two very different topics, things that many brothers that are watching or listening have no idea about. So that's what makes this program so, so cool. I mean, I, I really appreciate the the diversity that, that we bring in our conversations. So if you find some, if you know of someone who could enjoy these, these programs make sure to share it with them. And finally, thank you all the brothers that have been um, participating in the whiting stairs Freemasonry group. We're almost at 9,000 members in the group. Is that crazy? Awesome. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. It's uh, almost 9,000 brothers. And just like here, a diverse number of, of topics. And as I say goodbye, thank you for, for listening. And I invite you to go to the winding stairs.com. So you can check out the program called applied Freemasonry, where we take the, some of the lessons of Masonry, try to apply them to real life. We have a lot of brothers joining and, and it's very exciting. So anyway, enough, if, if enough of me, thank you brothers. Thanks Juan. Okay, I'll save RJ for last. Jason. All right, really great show. Uh, Robert, I appreciate you do you doing the yeoman's work of the research for this show. Uh, no problem. I learned, I learned a whole lot tonight. Kind of awesome. easy. 
because I was already doing all of it. But <laughs> thanks for allowing me to, uh, yeah. That that's fair. You you are welcome. Um, so yeah, you know, going back to my point earlier, you know, when you're looking at either bringing a right back or forming a new one, or you know, hey, I have these d degrees that I you know scrounged up somewhere. Uh, remember that buy-in is is critical to the success of your organization. Um, at least that's the way it works nowadays. And these guys had a great idea. They had a, a very sophisticated, well-developed system, but they didn't have the political savvy and the and the buy-in to ultimately enable their organization to succeed. And that was what killed them. And that's that's that shouldn't be how this fraternity is, but it is how this fraternity is when you get to that level, and there's no getting around it. Um, so on that note, on that sour note, uh, thanks so much for for watching and spending your Tuesday evenings or uh, you know your Wednesday morning commute or whenever you're watching this uh, with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, get your tickets for the 300 because it's going to be fantastic. And John, I will send it back to you for your final thoughts. Yeah, I'm not sending it back to Robert because he talked too much. <laughs> no, Robert, what have you got? Uh, just to say that um, it should be noted too that you know Jason said they had a well-developed system, and I think they did have a well-developed system to a point. But uh, you know, I am almost certain that having content, you know, it's also said that a lot of those degrees really. Uh, pulled directly from the ancient accepted Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction degrees as well. Uh, so I wonder how many of those degrees, they called them not always degrees, sometimes they just called them ceremonies. So how many of them had content? How many did were just skeletons? You know, we don't know for sure, but uh, well, I don't know for sure. Art de Hoyos probably knows. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to do the show. I know I yapped forever, and I went. I had to go through it fast because I really wanted to get through a lot of that and uh, give you guys a good basis. Uh, I find the Rite of Memphis really neat, interesting. Um, could it work today? No. Uh, there's just we can't get guys at a Blue Lodge meeting. I don't. It'd be cool for a minute, right? They'd be like the flavor of the week. Uh, educational purposes. Could the Grand College of Rights be cool and, and let some guys do that? Probably. Uh, do they do that? I've heard they don't. Uh, but if you're a Grand uh, College of Rights big guy and, and you're the guy who's signing the checks or whatever, uh, maybe, you know, say, hey, yeah, you can do that for education purposes if, if you don't like uh, what I'm saying. Uh, if you want to know the secrets and everything there is to know about this degree, all the passwords and stuff, I have them in a diary. And uh, I gave him to Marcus Brody. He's got a, a two-day head start on you, which is more than he needs. He's got a he's a, in a village from here to the Sudan. He speaks a dozen languages, knows every local custom. He'll blend in. He'll disappear. So if you actually tell me what movie that's from, uh, maybe I'll send you one of the papers that I have, or one of the one of the books. Indiana uh, Jones and the Last oh, Crusade, bitches. You son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my favorite scene. Anyway, that's all I got. Just, just thanks for bearing with me and all that. And uh, uh, thanks for letting me be just, you know, yapping. So thanks. All right. So, yeah, I, I got nothing much more to add. RJ did a great job. Again, if you want to, if you're a member of the Grand College of Rights, you can get a large portion of the research of those degrees uh, from the Collecti Collectiana, Volume 17, Parts 1, 2, and 3. Or just send Art Dehoyas a message and see how you can get, get a copy of it that way. Um, great research. Great topic. Learned a lot. Thank you very much. See you at 300. Thanks for watching. And keep searching for more light. Have a good night. You know, it kind of reminds me of like when the, someone wrote Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Yes. Right? They took Pride and Prejudice because it was public domain. And they just changed some of the story to include zombies. And then resold it as a new intellectual property, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is what you could do. King James Version, public domain. So take the book <laughs> of Joe, right? Modify it, 
So it has Job's daughters as a key attribute of as opposed to like the last sentence of the book. Right. <laughs> it's it, it wasn't Job who went through all the trials. It was his daughters who went through all the trials. I don't know. That would be pretty why why rebrand just that book? Just uh, uh King James Brown, King of Soul. <laughs> so I have seen, let's see, I've seen the Lolcat Bible full of memes like I can has salvation. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I've seen the Hacker Bible, Bible too, all written in like Leet speak. It's pretty funny. Oh my God. So there, there you go. Job's daughters, get on that. And then the last article I just found right before showtime was one related to a Russian diplomat. Jason, tell us more about this. All right. So there's a, a member of the Russian Duma, which is their parliament who um, has uh, called upon the rest of the Russian Duma and the Russian government to probe into Russian Freemasonry uh, to ascertain whether or not they are truly agents of subterfuge under the control of the West. And this, this is an interesting article. I've done a lot of research personally into um, Russian Freemasonry in, in general because I love Russian history. And it's it's not too far off with carrying the line that Catherine the Great did. So Freemasonry came into Russia mid 1700s with the birth of what the Russians termed the intelligentsia, which was essentially their their scholarly, their learned class. So their philosophers, their historians, their scientists, um, and that that flourished really in the the seventeen hundreds up until the early eighteen hundreds with the advent of Catherine the Great. So at this point, you had Peter the Great, um, who sought to westernize Russia and make it more like Europe, because uh, the Russians uh, always had this almost Napoleonic complex of, of being a backward society where, you know, men grew out their beards and, and they lived off the land. And, and Peter the Great, who was the Tsar of Russia at that point during the 1700s, um, said, no, you know, we want to model ourselves after Europe. We want to become a, a smarter civilization, a, a more polished civilization. And so he, in addition to doing a bunch of goodwill campaigns to Europe, he brought back a lot of European principles and ideals. And as part of that forced westernization of, of Russian culture, you had this growing learned class um, evolving in Russian or in Russia with like, you know, Alexander Pushkin, who is, uh, you know, one of Russia's, you know, most well-known poets and, and others. Um, and that's really when Freemasonry started to take a hold in Russia as well. Um, however, Catherine the Great comes in uh, early 1800s. I, I don't know the dates off the top of my head, but um, she starts getting very concerned about um, regime change and forced regime change. And the idea that these learned, these members of the learned populace might rise up and and overthrow her as as the Tsar. So she ends up um, persecuting a lot of the intelligentsia, kicking them out of Russia completely. And at that point, Freemasonry goes out of Russia with them. Um, and, it, and it dies at that point. Um, up until about the early 2000s when, I believe it was in 2005, the Grand Lodge of Russia um, came back and, and was, you know, formed again. And it's been operating in Russia since 2005 with a couple thousand members, Russian members of, of the organization. So this this member of the, the Russian parliament, the MP, whatever you want to call him, um, says he's he's taking a very Catherine the Great conspiracy theorist approach to say, look, Freemasonry came in with the intelligentsia from the West in the 1700s. Um, it has been seen as an agent of subterfuge and, and a politically motivated agent. And he's he's playing up this this 18th century idea of Freemasonry as something that could threaten, you know, the not necessarily the regime in Russia today, but the the lawmaking process in in Russia. 
and uh, he's he's doing it under the auspices of of you know Christianity. At least that's that's what the article is trying to make it out to be. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, they gay propaganda. You know, the the lawmaker was was known for his campaign targeting gay propaganda, um, but the idea of of gay propaganda and homosexuality in, in Russia is, is actually much, honestly, it's much more of, of a political issue in Russia, um, than it is even in the United States today, arguably, uh, because the, the Russian government is just, um, so against it. Um, and, and there's so much persecution and, and, um, against, you know, members of the alternative lifestyle. So, you know, they, the article says, you know, well, it's because he's he's a Christian lawmaker. It's like, well, you know, everybody in Russia is Eastern Orthodox, just like, you know, everybody in Europe is Roman Catholic. I mean, it's something you you grow up with as as a tradition, but it's it's more so the the political motivations behind um behind the policies than than the religion itself. Yeah. Well, I, I hope everyone today and you know in the united states i hope everyone's enjoyed uh, our episode on russian freemasonry and uh, i hope you guys will come back next week as we talk about the right of memphis yeah, uh, no we should probably do a full uh, a full show on. i was i was hanging on every word jason that's amazing you're like and this happened and that happened and yeah like why haven't we done a show on this before <laughs> i know what we're doing now you know that you know the uh i'm gonna say the a word uh you know the scene in space balls when uh president screws like why didn't somebody tell me my ass was so big? Yes. I felt like the same thing. It was like, why didn't somebody tell me Jason knew so much? <laughs> yeah, you'd never know, right? <laughs> by looking at me. Jason's the awesome. new Nick. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I don't have nearly that much time. <laughs> I'm not a bottled blonde. That's Neither hard. is Nick, but... I, I just thought that it was, this article was great because, one, it was on True News, so you, you know it has to be true. Second, <laughs> hence, hence, well, hence the emphasis on mega his, on Christianity and his, yeah. his Christian background. It had Russian. So I need to squash that Christians targeting gay propaganda, new world order. And I, I, I'm sure if you dig hard enough, there's lizard people in there somewhere. So it's, it, it's just, look at the, the just look at the tags on the article. It tells you everything you need to know. Well, you know, Russia actually does have a, a, a synthetic drug problem with something called crocodile. Which uh, actually is a synthetic drug that that turns your skin scaly like a lizard. So a lizard, lizard people are probably in there. There you go. Dang! Wow, that's the 99th degree. Oh. <laughs> that's a great segue into the DMT. The <laughs> DMT for show. Sure. DMT makes you a lizard man. Dimethyltryptophan FTW. <laughs> yeah. So about that. This week's episode is on the right of Memphis. Um, RJ threw this one out here because RJ has been researching this for a long time. And, ever and ever and ever. And because, it, you know, it grew up in his hometown. And so he'll talk a little bit about that. So why don't we just kick it right off and hand the talking stick to Robert. Sure. I his slides up here on my screen. Cool. So I got a, I got a really... Uh, basic slideshow. So if you're following along, great. Uh, and then stop me if you have questions. And uh, so essentially, what we have to you have to understand first of all, the right of Memphis grew out of uh, the right of Mizram, which by the time the right of Memphis came along, uh, Mizram was pretty much defunct. And then later on, there was a combination. But anyway, so the right of Memphis, I have a title up here. It says clandestine order or scapegoat. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Uh, so first of all, there's a little bit of a timeline. So um, if you can, I'll, I'll kind of mention some things as we go along here. But uh, according to uh, it's uh, J. A. Gottlieb, uh, he says that the right of Memphis was given to uh, this guy named Sam Samuel Honus, who was a native of Cairo. This uh, the guy who gave it to him. His name is Ormus, who is said to have been a Sephiric priest of Alexandria, and had these degrees. 
Sam Honus was a native of Cairo. He brings these degrees over to France in like 18... He, they actually get there in 1813. They introduced the degrees in 1814. Uh, they formed a grand body of uh, Rite of Memphis in 1815. And then basically uh, a bunch of lodges pop up here and there, a good handful, and there's some in Paris. There's some in uh, uh, Brussels and a couple other uh, places there, um, you know, I guess Western Europe. And uh, so this goes on forever. Uh, basically, um, in 1839, there's a couple guys. Uh, one's name is Marconi. The other guy's name is Malay. Marconi uh, becomes what they have is their highest order ever. It's the Grand Hierophant. Um, and so in 1839, he's the Grand Hierophant, like the head of the order. Like it would be like today in Blue Lodge if we had like the. Uh, not just a national grand lodge and a master, like a worldwide owner. Uh, so he's this, right? But what happens is in 1852 in France, uh, it's illegal to call yourself Masonic if you're not recognized by the Grand Orient of France. So they're shut down by civil magistrate in 1852. About 10 years goes by, and what's going on is Marconi's like, this stinks. Like we got to get the right back. So he appeals to the Grand Orient of France for recognition in 1862, um, and then in November of 1862, regulation. I'm sorry, recognition is is granted with stipulations. Uh, so the way I'm going to go through this is a little bit about how they formed, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the structure and kind of what happened and why they're not here anymore. So this was a an official, regular recognized. Masonic yeah. organization at one period in time. Well, yes and no. Sure. So go to the next slide, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so if you're if you're watching on the left, that's an actual uh, diagram of a chapter of uh, what they call a chapter of sorrow, uh, which is uh, the twenty first degree. Uh, so here's the rub, right? This is the the bummer part about getting their recognition back. Uh, Grand Orient of France says no problem, we'll recognize you. <clears throat> But you got to give up all your degrees and everything. You got to give them to us, and uh, so these guys have to hand over their degrees, and they're like, "Okay, like preserving, uh, preserving them. What's going on, right?" Then they're forced to give up all their titles. Man. They're forced into not, yeah, I know, right? But when you hear the the title of the Grand Master, you're gonna be like, "Oh, thank God." Uh, <laughs> that they gave up the title. So uh, then they're forced into not working any degrees higher than that of the master Mason. Um, and at this point also, it's not even that they can keep using their own degrees of one, two, and three. They have to now conform and use the grand orient of France's three degrees. So they allow the right of Memphis to exist, but it's only in name only. Uh, and then at a point, the degrees four through 33, they were kept active, but in your mind, like just picture a guy taking this, you know, four through 33 degrees and putting them on a shelf and saying, nobody can confer those because you don't have a patent or a warrant to do so. And then they take 34 through 95, 96 and 97. <clears throat> but 34, the reason I don't include 96 and 97 is because those are actually just uh, degrees given to titles, but the actual ceremonies, 34 through 95, are put on a shelf and they're basically treated as garbage, right? Like, there's going to be guys out there listening to this right now going, well, they weren't treated as garbage. But listen, they were put on a shelf. They didn't let anybody touch them. And that's the end of it. Like, they're gone. Um, so you've got this rub, right? So at this point, Marconi's like, okay, what else? Uh, so they force, uh, go to the next slide real quick. Uh, Marconi has to, is, is, is uh, part of the deal. Marconi has to give up his title as Grand Hierophant forever. And so any lodge that ever talks about the higher degrees, it mentions the titles that, hey, I used to be the Grand Hierophant or whatever, disciplined Masonically, like they sweep it under the rug. All you can be, like your lodge can be still a, a lodge of uh, Memphis, but you can't do anything. And you're, and if you tried to put on a fourth degree or a fifth degree or whatever, you got shut down and any attempt at reconstructing the right was deemed a high Masonic offense. And so why, 
you know, is what we have to ask. What, what's what's the big deal? <clears throat> uh, so this is part of the part of the problem. These guys just get shut down. So next slide. Uh, this is a quote, and this is taken from a letter uh, that was written uh, from the Grand Master of France to uh, a gent in uh, Britain uh, when a lodge, uh, a, a grand uh, consistory of Rite of Memphis was trying to be formed in Lancashire. And the quote is, the Rite of Memphis has been silenced. We tried and succeeded in destroying it. So, like, there's real animosity about this thing. They didn't want it around. And, I, and, and we'll get into a little bit of why that may be. Uh, next slide. So I have a diagram here with some colors and some arrows, but uh, essentially it shows that the right supposedly comes out of Egypt, goes to uh, France, and then over to New York, and then to uh, Chicago, to uh, Detroit, up to uh, over to Lancashire, England, and back to Canada. And along the way, it sprinkles in Italy with, uh, you know, you can talk about Cagliostro all day and his... Uh, yeah, Jason, I got slide typos. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, this is where, like, you know, like I said, there'll be some sprinkling of Cagliostro and the Rite of Memphis Miserum together and uh, some of the offshoots. But uh, strictly speaking of the Rite of Memphis, so during the 1860s, uh, uh, Marconi basically is, he leaves um, a a after they get their, their patent back or their, they're okay that they can be right of Memphis, but without doing any degree work, uh, they head over to New York and they start a temple or a grand consistory in New York, along with a guy named uh, Jay Pettit and uh, Marquis LaRoque. Uh, there's a couple other guys there, a guy named by the name of uh, Colt, uh, who I'll talk about later, who was actually an expelled member in one state, uh, regained admittance into another state, and uh, there's been a whole lot of hoopla about this guy's uh, regularity within the fraternity. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's said that the uh, grand consistory that started in New York was con was condensed to only 30 degrees and without losing their fundamentals. But I think really what they're talking about here is um, essentially he um, gains kind of a, a little bit of a trust issue. Um, he gets some trust from France, right? They're like, oh, you're going to start the right of Memphis in New York. And he's like, yeah, we're going to start it in New York. Well, what France doesn't know doesn't hurt him, right? So he starts conferring the other degrees. Uh, and then that catches on. And so at this point you have just what they what's loosely deemed right of Memphis. Um, and so they use the agreement from the Grand Orient, Grand Orient of France out of context to legitimize themselves. Uh, they had ex like huge growth. Grandmasters all over the place were, were joining the Rite of Memphis. Like it was huge. Uh, so in 1866, this is what, what I allude, alluded to earlier, is uh, Grand, uh, the, the, uh, the guy, his name is Colt uh, and Marconi, they uh, basically are trying to start, uh, actually there's a third party who tries to start a Grand Consistory in Lancashire. And... Britain is like, well, this is kind of weird. Let's uh, get to the bottom of this. So you guys legit? And he says, yeah, you know, we got the stuff from France, whatever, whatever. Dude from too Britain. Legit to quit. You're too legit to quit, exactly. The guy <laughs> from uh, Britain contacts the Grand Lodge of, uh, the Grand Orient of France, I should say. And uh, basically, in a nutshell, the guy gives a face palm and he says, dang it. You know, this guy said he was starting just doing his thing. We trusted them. They were supposed to just do the first three degrees. And, you know, they're they're clandestine over there. They're being clandestine. We own the rights of those rituals, and nobody has a warrant to confer them. I'm sorry to tell you this, brother, but I think you're going to have the same problem there in Lancashire. Well, the whole issue is, you know, on the slide I say 1866 Lancashire for good measure and that's because it's it's stated in their kind of in in the book by uh, J. A. Gottlieb that they did that to establish further legitimacy because the United Grand Lodge of England's there. It's kind of the home of Freemasonry. It legitimizes you by just having a lodge in the same country as something as big as U. G. L. E. So I really think that's the reason why they did that. Uh, uh, so next slide. 
So we had New York, Chicago, Detroit, and Canada. Uh, Canada was stated later. Um, in fact, if you um, if you are a member of the Grand uh... Hello and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly hangout where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions, make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, send questions and comments to our Twitter page, at Mason Roundtable, or on the Facebook event page for episode 159, The Right of Memphis. You know me, my name's John Ruark, past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. I will hand it off to Jason Richards for his introduction. Hey, good evening, everybody. Jason Richards here, Worshipful Master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in the District of Columbia. All right. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Happy to be here. Juan Sepulveda. Hello, everybody. Juan Sepulveda here from the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast and a brother from Orange Blossom Lodge number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida. Thank you, Juan. And last but not least... Robert Johnson. Hey guys, RJ, Robert Johnson uh, from Waukegan Lodge number 78, past master there, current secretary, and Juan likes Maker's Mark. Delish. Good stuff. Us. <laughs> us. We. Delish. Us. <laughs> oh. All right, let's get to Masonic news. We have, of course, first on the docket, the 300th celebration of Freemasonry that we are hosting come June 23rd, June 24th of this year, entitled 300 Freemasonry's Legacy, Freemasonry's Future. If you want to find out more, we have the full agenda posted, and uh, the frequently asked questions are being updated. Uh, we do have some hotels uh, booked at a discounted rate. Uh, I just haven't updated the page yet, so my apologies. I was planning a four-year-old birthday party this, this past week. and uh, But check that out this week. That'll be updated with the, the coupon code and the new thing added this week, what will be the attire for the event? I've had that question come up. The attire will be business casual for the majority of the day, but a coat and tie for the dinner Saturday night. There's plenty of places to Boom. step aside and uh, slip into your uh, coat and tie. We're trying to keep it classy as we culminate the event. So if you want to get a ticket, go ahead on over to the MasonicRoundtable.com slash 300 and go buy your ticket. See you there. Next up on Masonic News, we have an article from the past bastard that we did mention something uh, a couple weeks ago from Chris Hodap's blog on the the adults running the Job's Daughters International having some intellectual property issues. We even routed them to our IP their intellectual property slash copyright episode that we did uh, because they were trying to copyright the logo. Um, so timely. Which is which is within their purview as an organization. Yes. It's Perfect. just a bit draconian when you place such strict rules on your organization's branding that you you don't even allow your your members to um, to do anything with it. So what's, what's what's the fun in that? You're really cutting yourself out of of advertising completely at yeah. that point. It's um, like, hey, uh, you want to have a uh, Job's daughter's pancake breakfast? Totally cool. Don't you dare put the logo on the ticket. It's yeah, it, in fact, don't even mention Job's daughter's international. <clears throat> <laughs> I mean, it's just well, they're trying to create a separation between pancake breakfast and their brand, which I understand. Fundraiser, right? Yes, but who who doesn't like hoodies? Like hoodies are amazing. I give you that. Yeah, so I I will give the past bastard credit where credit is due. This was actually one of their more clever articles, um, you know, talking about the the Job's daughters international uh, trying to sue God. For, for trademark infringement um, because the book of Job was included in the Bible. And, uh, <laughs> no. 
<laughs> I think one of the one of the best parts of the entire article really is is where they uh, they say, you know, we don't we don't want to get rid of the Book of Job. We just want to cut down on the versions and control it a little bit better. So if you want to, you can buy the authorized version at our like you know online store. <laughs>